Baker as chief commentator of Business and News Reports. Thank well, you. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. I'd like to call our next witness, Donald Trump, who certainly needs no introduction. To he, your fame and reputation precede you, Donald. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, we know you to be very frank and outspoken, and uh, you've had ex extensive experience, not only in real large real estate outspoken. developments, but also in sports and gaming and entertainment industries. And I'm glad you're able to make it here this morning and appreciate your, your waiting and being so patient as you have been. So we welcome you, especially uh, to listen and uh, learn from your experiences, as we know you've been very much involved in regard to this credit crunch that we have before our nation today. So you may proceed in any way that's comfortable with you. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Donald, you may proceed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, I think uh, I could say to Mr. Seidman, who I, I believe has done a really fantastic job while he was in government, that uh, had the 1986 catastrophe of the Tax Reform Act not been passed, I'm not sure that you'd know Mr. Seidman in the capacity of RTC. You'd know him in some perhaps more positive capacity, but not in the Resolution Trust. And I think in bringing that point up to Mr. Seidman before he tended to agree with me, I think. Good. So uh, this, this tax uh, act was just an absolute catastrophe for the country, for the real estate industry, and I really hope that something can be done, uh, as Congressman Thomas uh, recently said, that something can be done to change at least parts of it, because it has taken all incentive away from investing in real estate, and real estate really means so many jobs. I mean, you have a city called New York City. You have a city, Boston. You have other cities and, and so many other cities. But I can tell you from very personal knowledge, New York City has virtually no construction right now. And we're not only talking about office buildings, of which there are many. We're talking about housing, moderate income housing, low income housing, even high income housing, where you, you create jobs. You create so many other things. They buy carpet. They buy furniture, they buy refrigerators, they buy other things that fuel the economy. And incentive has to be put back into the construction of things that are needed, such as housing of all kinds. Uh, I heard this morning that we've had the lowest number of houses built uh, in terms of the housing uh, since 1946 or 1947. And that's not much of a tribute to this uh, group of folks that are representing the country, unfortunately. I feel. Uh, you know, I feel very badly about it. Everybody feels very badly about it. The fact is that the one word that nobody up on the panel is, has mentioned is the word depression. And I truly feel that this country right now is in a depression. It's not a recession. People are kidding themselves if they think it's a recession. You look at what's happening in the automobile business, in the, in the retailing business, the retailing business in any part of the country virtually is a total disaster. feels very badly about it. The fact is that the one word that nobody up on the panel is, has mentioned is the word depression. And I truly feel that this country right now is in a depression. It's not a recession. People are kidding themselves if they think it's a recession. You look at what's happening in the automobile business, in the, in the retailing business, the retailing business in any part of the country virtually is a total disaster. But the real estate business, we're in an absolute depression. And one of the reasons we're there is what happened in 1986, in addition to what Mr. Seidman said, is what happened in 1986 with the, uh, with the changes. So I really came on the basis that I wanted to, I'll answer questions on it, but I wanted to discuss the Tax Act of 1986. Uh, active, passive, you're absolutely right, 100% right, and something has to be done. It has to be brought back. It has to be reformed. It has to be taken care of. I think for certain types of uh, building, such as housing. I think depreciation schedule should be very severely limited cut so that people have incentive to build housing as opposed to commercial, which really, again, the commercial uh, is probably taken care of for a long while. The reason it's taken care of for a long while, however, unfortunately, 
is the fact that the economy is so bad that there's no reason for the commercial. And I think that gets taken care of and gobbled up very quickly had the, if the economy improved. One of the big things that we don't have today that we used to have and that was a very good thing for real estate, and that's the whole word of syndication and investment. And if you're a dentist and you're making two hundred or $300,000 a year and you, you can't invest now in real estate. The reason the stock market is artificially high, in my opinion, is there's no other form of investment. I mean, you can't put it into real estate and you can't put it into bonds. So people are putting it into a stock market. All the companies in the stock market are doing lousy, but their stock is high. And I think what we have is when the stock market goes down by, let's say, a thousand points in two days, which perhaps it might, then we're in a full-scale depression. Then everybody admits it. Then the politicians admit it. The president's going to admit it. Everybody's going to admit it. And right now, the only thing that sort of keeps the word depression off their list, lip, lip is the fact that we really have a 3,000 stock market and people are surprised to see it. Because the companies certainly aren't doing very well within, within the market itself. But the syndication of real estate was a very positive thing. And you can't syndicate. You can't have people putting up equity. That would take a lot of the strain off the banks. If people could put up equity in the form of equity money for syndication, where you used to be able to go out and syndicate a piece of real estate today, you can't. A lot of the strain that we're talking about liquidity crisis, a lot of the strain comes off the banks. And I think it could really open up a whole new market. And the other thing is, frankly, by having cut the high income tax rates to 25%, as an example, people don't have the incentive anymore to invest. They're saying, why should I take a chance on investing in low or moderate income housing? I might as well just pay the tax. But the fact is that 25% for high income people, for high income people, it should be raised substantially with the understanding that if you invest, you can get it down and down substantially below that number. The incentive was taken away when the tax rates came down for high income people. And I say leave the middle, leave the low, lower them. But people with money have to have the incentive. The dentists, the doctors, they have to have the incentive to invest and there is no incentive. So New York City desperately needs housing. There's no housing being built. Every city needs housing now. There's no housing being built. And I hope in ways and means they're gonna be able to do something with respect to housing because if, it, if it's not done, you're just not gonna have any construction jobs in this country. And New York City has the lowest number of construction workers, I think, since the Depression. I was with a, uh, a very, very capable firm the other day, the biggest construction firm in New York City, HRH. And it's called HRH Construction. And we were discussing what they had planned. They said they have not one building planned in New York City for the next two to three years. Now, you think of that. Not one building planned. So you say that means not one electrical worker. I mean, they're just finishing up some buildings, and when those buildings are finished, there's going to be nobody employed in the biggest industry in the country because construction is the biggest industry in the country. And there's going to be virtually nobody employed. So I just uh, come, I was asked to come by the chairman, and I make this plea that if something isn't done to put the incentive back, I mean, we're no different right now than the Soviet Union. They have no incentive, and we have no incentive. And if something isn't done to quickly put the incentive back, this country is going to be in very deep problems. It already is, but it's going to get far worse. Now, let me ask you, if Congress does nothing, doesn't take any course of action whatsoever, how long do you think it would take our country to climb out of the economic crisis that it's in today? Well, I think if incentives aren't given through taxing and other means, I believe that this country could be in this deep recession slash depression for years, for years. I see no, no sign of any kind of an upturn at all. There's no incentive to do anything. There's no incentive to invest. Uh, Everyone's doing badly. Everyone. The wealthiest people are doing badly. The poor people are doing badly. The Everybody is doing badly. I mean, you walk around the cities today, very, very few are doing well. And unless the incentive is given back to this country, and it's been taken away with 1986, unless it's given back, I really think you could be. I mean, there's an expression that we're using, survive till 95. I think it's maybe longer than that. It's survive to 95. I think we're being generous. It's really, really bad. And you folks are going to have to do something to fix it and to get people moving. 
How did we get here as we are? Uh, has it been the mountain of debt that's been created in the public and private sector? Uh, well, I think has it been the generosity, as Mr. Seidman said, of our tax laws and allowing interest rates to be deducted so that it encourages a debt-driven economy? Well, I think we got here by the fact that at the time certain things were done. I can speak in terms of the real estate business. Certain deals were made predicated on a certain tax policy. And then that tax policy was changed. I mean, I, I truly believe that you wouldn't have had the savings and loan crisis. I mean, you save minutia compared to the money that you've wasted on bailing out the savings and loans. Now, your insurance companies are in deep trouble. And I think they're going to get much worse because so much of their portfolio is in real estate. And I think you better save the real estate now. I mean, I can tell you, I buy things, I bought things that were great deals in the middle 80s and, the, and even the later 80s. But when that tax law kicked in, you know, really kicked in, all of a sudden those deals, which were good economic deals, were no longer good economic deals. Mm -hmm. Because they changed the game on me and they changed the game on everybody else. And it's pretty unfair. You make a deal predicated on a certain tax law, and then they change, the, uh, they change the rules. So a lot of the problems that you've experienced are because of the fact that some very foolish people, in order to save a small amount of money, because they heard the word tax shelter, and they thought the word tax shelter was a bad thing, as opposed to saying it's an investment in real estate. I mean, an investment in low-income housing, they call a tax shelter. And the word tax shelter is like the word junk bond. It's a very bad sounding word, even though it isn't necessarily a bad thing. So they heard the word tax shelter, and politically they didn't like that word, and they said, let's get rid of tax shelters. But when they got rid of tax shelters, they got rid of people investing in low and moderate income housing and lots of other good things. And I think you're going to have to go back. They could have corrected 1982, the law, 1982. They could have corrected it, gotten rid of the abuse, and had a great situation today. You wouldn't have had the savings and loan problems. I don't think you would have had many of the banking problems. You wouldn't have had what is going to befall you now, I think. They were just stronger to start off with. But I think the insurance companies are going to be in very deep trouble because of the values of their real estate have been eroded because of what Congress has done. So you have some very deep problems that can be co corrected fairly simply by putting the incentives back. Uh, real estate has always been one of America's favorite industries. The tax code has long favored real estate to a great extent because it employs so many people and is so important for the welfare of our economy. Um, uh, in 1981, uh, we became very generous with real estate. We cut depreciation schedules in half. We gave tax credits. Would you say that's where we started to go wrong? Is that where we were no, overbuilding shopping go... centers and commercial yeah. buildings that were not filled? Well, I think, I think that's where you started to go right, but maybe, to, maybe there was an excess. Um, I think if it was channeled more toward the housing, which has always been, I mean, there's never been enough housing. You need it desperately. And I'm talking all forms of housing. You need it desperately. Including low-income housing. Including low-income yes. housing, absolutely. And including senior citizen housing and dormitory housing and other forms of housing. Uh, there, there has never been. It's an insatiable thing. And you could really get that going. But what you're also getting going is jobs. Because I'll tell you what, New York unemployment and other cities' unemployment is astronomical. I think it's much higher than the numbers are indicating. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's been reflected yet. If you look at what's going to happen with the construction industry in the next few years, forget it. There's not going to be anybody working. Mm -hmm. So I really think you need that for a lot of reasons, but also to spur jobs. Passive losses, one thing that many people draw attention to. Uh, Mr. Seidman, you did. Members of this committee did. Uh, when we passed it, we had no hearings to my knowledge on it. It happened almost overnight, and it was a surprise, so that it was never given the full thought and attention it should have before we made such a bold and important move. Uh, there is a bill now that Mike Andrews has with uh, several hundred, uh, I understand, uh, sponsors that hasn't moved through the committee yet, the Ways and Means Committee, which says that developers should, uh, uh, if they're in full-time occupation, uh, in real estate development uh, should be excluded from the passive law, uh, 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 rules law. Uh, I assume you agree with this, and I'm wondering whether or not you think it should even go beyond real estate developers. Well, I think it has to go beyond developers because we're going to get a lot of the liquidity from people outside that are making money and can invest in real estate. Right now, they can't invest in real estate. As far as the passive laws, 
I mean, I did hear things about a 1986 pass of laws, but nobody ever thought it would be possible for something like this to get passed, and all of a sudden it's passed, and everybody, including the United States government, is left holding the bag, and a lot of other governments, by the way. And now it's very dif difficult to get rid of because the revenue loss, if we, uh, with the marginal uh, uh, rates of our income tax, would have to go up so high. They did that so that they could bring the marginal rates down. Well, I don't the think they would go up. I think you'd end up bringing much more money into the system so that you may look at a specific loss, but I think the incentives and everything else would bring so much more money into the system mm -hmm. that the numbers of anyone that says that would just be you know, far, far better than anybody really understands or knows. Hopefully we can cure these excesses. Just let me lastly turn to capital gains. Well, it, President Kennedy brought our capital gains down to 20 percent. Now, of course, it seems to be a bad word uh, in certain corners of Capitol Hill. Um, would you say that we should go back to the tr traditional type of capital gains where all kinds of equities in real estate be given the normal uh, deduction that we had uh, pre-1986, uh, or should we just target our capital gains to capital ventures, uh, to resources that we need to have particular growth in? I think it could be targeted, but I think that capital gains is important, and I think real estate in particular in this country really needs help because it's such a dominant force. It just gets everything else going. And if you can get real estate going, if you can get construction going in the country, I think that's the way you get out of the recession or depression. And for savings, super IRAs like uh, Benson has uh, over in the Senate side, you're for that? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hal Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for being here, Mr. Trump. Thank you, Mr. Uh, what would prevent, if we restored the passive uh, loss provision of the 86 Act, what would prevent uh, excesses uh, under a reinstated passive loss provision that led to over commercial building previous to 86? Well, I think one thing that could be done is you could re-examine this over the years so that if in two or three or four years you saw a great deal of housing, and I think that would be unlikely because it does seem to be insatiable, but if you saw, and I hope you'll have this problem, frankly, but if you saw so much housing being created by the reinstatement or the cessation. I think that uh, you could probably take another look at it and maybe terminate it at that point for the future. But um, I just feel that you really, I mean, that was a, a tremendously negative provision and it really hurt this country. It, tr it truly hurt the country. Would you limit its reinstatement to uh, residential properties? Well, it just seems that that's what's really needed now. I mean, everyone agrees that you need housing, and, and you probably always will need vast amounts of housing. So it seems that that's what's needed. But you have to understand, when the economy comes up, you know, th these buildings, many of the buildings built right now, built and empty and see-throughs and all, uh, when they were built, it seemed like a good idea by a lot of people and a lot of honest people. You know, the banks that loaned the money weren't all bad. And what happened to a lot of people is the economy went bad. And now everybody says, how could they have built this much space? But the fact is, this space, if the economy had stayed like it was in 86 and 85, that space would have been gobbled up and they'd be building more and everybody would be happy right now. I mean, the economy went very, very bad. And you look at various cities, they're cutting back on space. I mean, I'm seeing things where they have less space this year than they had uh, two years ago. It's, it's you know, unheard of, unheard of statistics. So nobody could have predicted what was going to happen with the economy. So it would be nice to have it across the board. It would be nice to say that the banking system and various other controls will take care. But you certainly, at, at a minimum, you should have it for the housing industry, my opinion. Mr. Seidman seemed to say, and, and, and he's behind you and can, and can correct me if I'm misstating his testimony, part of it. He, in essence, said that uh, <clears throat> a recovery in the overall economy is the only way to cure the real estate problem. You're seeming, uh, you seem to say <clears throat> that uh, the reinstatement of the passive loss provision of 1986 TEFRA would lead us out of the recession. Well, no, I'm not saying that alone. I'm also, I'm agreeing with Mr. Seidman, except I'll take the word only out. I think that the government can do quite a bit also, including the shortening of depreciation schedules, uh, the 
power to syndicate, the right to syndicate, which also has to do with the active passive. Uh, if, if we were able to syndicate development, or able to syndicate even buildings that are built and successful and good that you can't get a mortgage on. I mean, I have a friend, he's got a building with an IBM triple net mortgage, he, uh, with an IBM triple net lease, he can't get a mortgage on the building. <coughs> And it's a perfect, beautiful, nice little building with IBM as a tenant, and he can't get a mortgage because it's real estate, because the banks are allowed a certain amount of real estate, and they want to cut down on the real estate. So even a good loan like that, they don't want to put it because they don't want to be associated this year with real estate. This is a bad year for real estate. This has been a bad two years for real estate. Hopefully in two years from now, everyone's going to want real estate. It runs in cycles. But you really, um, you really can do things other than just economy. I mean, I think you can, sp I'd like to say that you can spur the economy through taxes so that the economy actually gets good. Now, we, we're operating under the Budget Act, the Budget Agreement Summit, which has a pay-go provision, pay-as-you-go. If, you, um, if you reduce taxes, you got to make up the revenue somewhere else, so that we have a, 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 a revenue neutral action. Are you saying that if we reinstate the uh, passive loss provision, we're going to have some lost revenues because of that? Am I hearing you say that you would increase the, the income tax rates of the higher uh, income people? Well, I would do that. Difference? Yes, sir. I would do that because. I believe strongly that people don't have enough incentive to invest right now at 25%. I just don't believe they have enough incentive to take the risk of investment with recapture and all of the other problems of, of investing in real estate and other things. And I would absolutely do that with the understanding that if they do make the investments, they can go down to the minimum level. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about that. As far as the $5 billion that we're talking about, that $5 billion in loss of taxes may contribute a hundred billion dollars because of the incentives that it it gives. I, see, I don't look at that as a loss in taxes. I think that so much work could be created by getting rid of that horror show that you may take in a hundred million. Now, an accountant will tell you, well, we're going to lose five billion dollars. But in actuality, it could spur hundreds of billions of dollars worth of work. I thank you for your testimony. You've been very helpful. Thank you, sir. Mr. Huckabee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Trump, you mentioned uh, the Soviet Union and no incentives there. You know, for the last 45 years, we've been engaged in Cold War with the Russians. Uh, clearly, I think a year ago, it became apparent that we've won that war. We, we spent tremendous dollars in the 1980s, as did the Russians in the military buildup, and it broke our, their system, in my opinion, left us with a big debt. But clearly, we're the surviving superpower today. And here we find ourselves taking a micro look at this economy, inflation very low, running around 3 percent, interest rates lower than they've been in 19 years, no shortage of food, no shortage of oil, the things that have put us in recessions in our lifetime. And you seem to be saying, and I believe I agree with you, that you can trace this recession totally to the 1986 Tax Act and the devastating effect it had on real estate. But yet, prior to 1986, the tax laws were so generous that it seems to me that an awful lot of building was being driven by the tax code rather than a demand. Would you comment on this? Well, I agree with that, and I agree that there was abuse, and there was a uh there were openings in that law which could have easily been stopped and that could have been corrected. But what they did is they took an overall picture of the entire tax with the new Tax Reform Act of 86 and they totally destroyed the incentive that was proper in 1981. There were a lot of good things in 1981 and there were some bad ones and the bad things should have been corrected. But they could have been corrected without having destroyed all of the incentive. For instance, we've had recessions before during my lifetime, which is now getting a little bit older and older and older. But in 1975, we had a recession, but that was a picnic compared to this. That was an absolute picnic. That was a question of, of uh, some liquidity, some this, some that. This, nobody knows when this is going to end. You know, I, I sort of smile as I saying, when do you think it's going to end? Nobody has the faintest idea. There's absolutely no hope 
in sight unless something is done by the government to spur the economy, because the, go the economy is not going to spur itself. I, I think uh, uh, all of the members here have, have seemed to imply that they favor the changes in the uh, passive uh, losses. You've mentioned uh, uh, change in, the, in depreciation schedules, uh, I guess reverting back to accelerated depreciation. I think that was one of the areas, uh, looking back in the past, that was perhaps the greatest abuses where one could recover their entire investment uh, in perhaps three years as a result of tax uh, Right house. Which of these areas do you think would be more important? Well, I think the uh, I think the accelerated depreciation and the shortening of schedules is very important in terms of getting getting something going. And again, we really need something going now. You can come back in two years or three years if it starts moving, and you can terminate that. But you have to get something going. If if it's not started soon, uh, we're just going to be in a free fall. I, I agree with you that, that there's probably an infinite demand for housing out there and that we certainly should change our tax laws to encourage investment there from, from low income housing all the way up the scale. But you've suggested a new twist here that it's necessary to raise the top tax bracket from 31 to 33 percent up to 40 or 50 percent and in order to encourage people to invest in these areas. Uh, is that really correct? If we had the passive losses and the accelerated depreciation and one can anticipate uh, future increases in the value, do you think it's necessary to increase the tax rate? I think it would be a big help for the upper income taxpayer to, to have incentive rather than paying taxes to invest. I think that the accelerated depreciation, depreciation schedules being shortened would be a tremendous help for the obvious reason that you'd be able to get assuming the active passive and assuming the right to syndicate, you'd be able to get investors to come into real estate transactions. And I'm, I'm not talking about only new building. I'm talking about existing. Mm -hmm. Because you have existing buildings with mortgages on them where the mortgages are coming due and there's no bank in the world, and I'm talking good buildings that are making money, there's no bank in the world that will give you refinancing. So if you could bring in equity money through syndication, that would be a great thing. That would be a really great thing because you'd open up the liquidity of the system so the banks can loan not only to real estate but to other things because right now there's just no liquidity. If you brought in equity, non-interest bearing equity, that would be a, a tremendously positive boost for the economy. How high are, do you think you would have to take the, tax the top tax brackets in order to make this happen? Well, I mean, the higher it is, the more incentive there would be. Uh, I guess it was 50 and it was 60 at one point and it was obviously even higher than that. But the higher it is, the more incentive, and I don't mean middle income and I don't mean low income. If anything, that could be, stay the same or be lowered. But I'm talking about the people that are making a great deal of money should have an incentive to invest. And I know it was 50 and I'm talking about a substantial increase with the ability to get it down to the minimum number. Thank you. Create Thank a lot you, of Mr. jobs. Chair. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Trump. That's interesting. I've never really heard you in terms of your professional expertise. I've only read about you in terms of other activities, and I have to say that I admire you in terms of your professional expertise. I have been fighting the 1986 tax bill ever since it was passed. I think there were three really pernicious provisions, along with all of the other onerous ones. We've been talking about one in particular, changing of the rules, and I'll spend some time about passive loss in a minute. The second one that we haven't dwelt on was the change which almost invited, literally invited, the American homeowner to exchange equity for debt because we removed the tax deductibility of consumer debt and then change the rules to allow them to squander the equity in their homes. Absolutely. And then thirdly, a point that Mr. Seidman mentioned that most people don't realize was the retroactive aspect of that bill, where many people had made decisions about pensions and their retirement tied to real estate in which the government changed the rules after the fact. You could not believe the decision that the government made prospectively, and I think psychologically, that would significantly damage us. In terms of passive loss, and I know there are a lot of people watching who don't really understand what, what we're talking about. We're talking about the rules under which people make decisions to invest their money. There's no question that there were tax strategies built into the code 
that allowed people to take advantage of so-called shelters. We've talked about the excesses of the early 80s. The cry for 1986 was, don't let the tax code dictate economic behavior. But I think you've quite rightly pointed out that one of the reasons the stock market is overly priced is that because of the tax code, that's the only game in town, that we are dictating economic behavior today. The loss of equity in terms of the homeowner is a tax code structure. We are continuing to dictate economic behavior. And I think the thing you have to understand, which I know you appreciate, is that the tax code is going to dictate economic behavior. There is no way for it not to if you have a tax code. That's right. And what you've asked for is for the tax code to create incentives for behavior. I agree with you. The problem is I think people are overstating the correction necessary for passive loss <coughs> changes. The bill that uh, I originally sponsored and that uh, I agreed to join in a co-sponsorship with Mike Andrews of Texas has been honed down <coughs> to only cost about $2.8 billion uh, over five years. The problem with the passive loss rules changes, as you well know, was not just to get rid of tax shelters. That is, people who were not materially participating in real estate, like the dentists and the doctors that you have suggested uh, would reinvest, uh, were investing for purposes of tax shelters. There's nothing wrong with allowing them to uh, invest if they believe they can have an economic gain. You don't have to tilt the tax code in their direction if there's an opportunity to make money in the real estate area. The problem with the passive loss rules changes was that people who were literally actively involved in real estate aren't allowed to take losses right. against their activities. Right. And we railed long and hard, uh, uh, Chairman is not here, behind closed doors in the committee when this provision was put in the bill. It was an attempt by people who did not understand the real world to take an academic definition and stick it into the tax code. We have lived under this academic definition, I think, far too long. And I really appreciate your, your real world plea that we make the kinds of adjustments that won't lead us to the over excesses of the early 80s, but will allow those who want to participate and to create an active real estate market to be able to do so. One last comment on depreciation. You need to know that the requirement under the 86 tax bill was that it be revenue neutral that we make these multi-billion dollar adjustments within the tax code, but that we come out even dollars. The depreciation schedule was literally an accordion that was squeezed or stretched to produce the dollar numbers necessary to make the package revenue neutral. It was not designed to create an honest return on investment in the real world. It was a political gimmick to fill revenue gaps. And I just, I just want to thank you. You have had to live with it. I think the American people have had to live with it far too long. We aren't talking about recreating 60 or 70 percent tax levels to fund a passive loss change. I agree with you that if people are going to have their money eaten up by uh, the tax code, that they're going to look for ways to invest it and to make money. Incentives need to be built in, don't need to be built that high. We could use some of that money to adjust the depreciation schedule so that we don't create a massive tax loss. Correct. Your reaction? I, I agree with you 100 percent, sir. I've got to get you in front of the committee. <laughs> of ways and means uh, as well as these kinds of committees. We have literally hundreds. We have over 300 members who have co-sponsored our passive loss legislation. It is uh, not on the front burner in terms of any tax changes. What, what is being contemplated by the committee are political responses of adjustments within brackets to create a quote unquote tax break for the middle class and that if you would urge people who uh, are in the private sector who have had to live for far too long uh, to contact the chairman of the Ways and the Means Committee, Dan Rostenkowski, contact Mike Andrews, contact myself about our passive loss legislation, for three to five billion dollars I can think of no better 
immediate shot in the arm for our recovery. It is an enormous uh, advantage, and I agree totally with you that when you try to construct a model that says it will lose three to five billion dollars in the tax code, yes, because we will change definitions in the code. But what we also change is behavior. And when that behavior exhibits itself in the real estate market, I also agree with you, there will be hundreds of billions of dollars of exchange of circular flow of economic activity of jobs and that there will be no loss of revenue to the government. Absolutely right. So, so I really appreciate uh, I wish I had a lot of questions for you, but you already said everything for me that needed to be said. I just wanted to put it in the context of where we are. A relatively simple change to correct a serious error in the 86 tax bill could go a long way, structurally, but I think also psychologically to indicate that we are doing something, we do understand the problem, and we are responding. Thank you, Congressman. And I thank you for your testimony. It's Thanks. a shame, Congressman, that uh, this very powerful and important industry doesn't have a better lobby, because I watch things being lobbied that, that should never be passed, and they get passed, and I look at things like this, and as you say, it's on a back burner, and you know how important it is. And the real estate industry is a group of thousands of people some wealthy, some not wealthy, most not very wealthy right now. And I will tell you, uh, they have absolutely the most pathetic lobby in the history of the United States Congress. It is so bad. And I don't know how many of these people behind me are lobbyists, but they're not doing a very good job, I can tell you that. I just tell the gentleman that if he would uh, appear before the committee or several others like him, they wouldn't need lobbyists. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Seems to be obviously the name of the game in Washington is to have an effective lobby, and then you get the laws passed that you prefer, need to get passed uh, for that particular industry. Uh, Mr. Uh, John Spratt. Mr. Trump, thank you for your testimony. And in, in the interest of time, I'll put one question to you. Obviously, you've operated at a vaster, higher scale than I did when I was involved a little bit in real estate development. But usually, when we syndicated a project, what drew the participants or limited partners to the syndication was not just the pass-through of losses, but the fact that they could leverage their uh, returns by writing off losses below the actual cash investment. Do you think that's a good rule and should continue? I think it's a rule that works in terms of getting people started, and it, it certainly had an effect, and it can be limited to an extent <laughs> if need be. But right now, we don't need limits. We need action, because if there's not action, you're not going to have an industry. You're not going to have a real estate industry. And I'm, I'm yeah. really talking to a large extent, because, you know, we talk about the overbuilding done during the 80s. But I'm really talking about things that are existing, not just for new construction, but things that are existing. Because you cannot get financing for any building, no matter how good it is, no matter how good your tenant is, you cannot not get financing for it under any circumstances, anybody. If it has real estate associated with it, you cannot get financing. And that's a pretty pathetic situation. Now, maybe that changes, but I think you people are going to be the ones that are going to have to make a change. The point was, though, that when you described the syndication, you were talking about nearly an all-equity syndication, and I rarely saw an all-equity syndication. Usually the attraction was that... Oh, uh, oh I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean all-equity. No, I meant there'd be a mortgage or there'd be a certain amount of debt, and there may be 20 or 25 percent of equity infusion. That's a positive thing, because you'd have a lower mortgage. You'd have, therefore, a lower interest rate on the mortgage and you'd have 25 percent of no interest for, you know, essentially interest-free sure. equity. Sure. you've so still, you still got to find thing. the bank that uh, makes up the other 75 percent. Well, the, the bank could make company. it up, or you could have, again, it, it varies. I mean, you could have from 50 to almost 100 percent, and, and, but you could have a large amount of equity infusion, and I think that's a real positive thing. But right now, under the existing laws, you can't do that. You can't even talk to people about it because it doesn't work. I've got developer clients who still survive. They think that this has been a shakeout and fit have survived. And they look back on the period from 81 to 86 and they say there were a lot of characters in the business who shouldn't have been there. They were distorting the market by doing deals that were totally tax deals. They had no economic reality. Would you agree with that assessment? I, I would partially. I think there were some, a lot of good people in the market that got whacked. And I think that there were a lot of bad people that maybe deserved to get whacked. Thank you very much for Thank your testimony. You, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, Helen Bentley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Trump, I want to thank you for being here today and for your 
stand on uh, American manufacturing over the years. Uh, I was one of those with Mr. Thomas who early on in the, as they were considering the 86 tax act was, I described it as, it stinks. And I think that's the best description I can still get, give to it today. You've been talking about real estate here, but that tax act also eliminated investment tax credits. Yes. He eliminated um, interest deductions on the purchase of items. And we have a little bank in my area, which just this past week uh, has reduced uh, by 1% the interest on anybody who wants to buy an American car. Okay? The number of phone calls that that bank has had since that ad was put in has been phenomenal. And why can't, what do you think would happen to getting manufacturing going, which in turn helps with your real estate, et cetera, et cetera, if we would give some inducements to investment tax credits on American manufactured products? I think it's a truly spectacular idea. Okay. Um, oh. There we are. Are you going to join me, Mr. Thomas? I already have a bill in for uh, right, tax Gorini? credits. Okay. Uh, so I agree with you. Okay, very good. I need to get some of my good Republicans to agree with me on that, too. But uh, I think what we're, one of our problems has been that we've been talking about free trade far too much instead of fair trade. And as a result, uh, uh, we're all getting, uh, feeling the effects of it. And I think some of the people behind you are some of the people who have been hurt. Uh, as a result of some of the pressures on free trade of exporting jobs overseas. Again, Mr. S Trump, thank you for being here today, and I'd someday like to pursue some of your thoughts on the manufacturing uh, further. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Jim Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Trump. I want to take this opportunity to perhaps outline things in a way that uh, might seem sophomoric, but realizing that this is an opportunity because of someone with your high profile to have people who do not deal with financial markets understand some of the dilemma we find ourselves in and some of the ways of getting out of it. Explain in very simple terms how a developer such as yourself with an idea for a project takes the cost of the project prior to 1986 and the impact of that act, takes that project cost proposes a financing mechanism and goes about getting investors. Just briefly outline anything, whether it's a commercial or residential real estate it be, That's a long, uh, it could be a pretty long answer, but just briefly, um, you conceive of a development in a site, it usually starts with a piece of land. Uh, you conceive of this, you go and you get your zoning or you have your zoning. You get your architects, you get your engineers, you get your planners. You design something that you think is going to be nice and economic and all of the things that it's supposed to be. You then go out and get your financing, ideally. You used to go out and get your financing. Today, you don't even think about it. Um, you then go out and get your financing. You build your job. You hopefully have a success, and you've created a lot of jobs in between for lots of people that are buying lots of different things for the families, including other homes, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really a process, and that is the process. But that process is now circumvented because uh, it's impossible to get financing for any development in this country, I would say, right now. And explain to them also that at the end of the trail, when you've had both an interim lender, meaning somebody who gave you a construction loan, and then a permanent lender who took that interim lender out and looked at this project over long term, that projects you did prior to 1986 that were either in a stage of an interim lender or had been completed, that even though those had been completed, even though they had been conceived under tax laws that then, depreciation that then, allowed you to make that decision to go to the bank, and that the loan was economically viable by a loan officer who looked at it, it made sense to them, explain how even though it was done under the previous rules, the subsequent rules were applied to you and the kind of economic impact they had for a completed transaction. They weren't grandfathered, essentially. Correct. Uh, you bring up a great point because I have never understood how this is possible. I have never understood how somebody throughout this country didn't sue the United States government and have that overturned. I mean, you had people 
investors investing over a 10-year period for a set of, under a set of conditions, and this is as I was talking before, playing the game. We're all playing by a certain set of rules. The rules were changed for the government, but they weren't changed for us. I mean, it was an incredible, it was an incredible circumstance that happened. And people went bust by the hundreds of thousands, and I, I hope you weren't one of them in terms of that, but obviously you know a lot of people that were. They changed the rules on taxes, and you have, I mean, you have some incredible situations where people guaranteed personally a stream of payments to be paid over a 10-year period based on a stream of tax benefits for perhaps a very good job, like a low-income housing development. Nothing wrong with that, a very positive thing. And after two years, they got wiped out with the taxes, and yet they still owed all of this money. And many of these people, most of these people, had to declare bankruptcy. They couldn't pay it. So they personally guaranteed a stream of payments. How that wasn't grandfathered for those people, I've never understood. How it wasn't overturned by the courts, and I'm sure many people must have brought lawsuits, but I haven't heard of any successful lawsuit on it, is just beyond me. Because it's probably the most unfair thing that I've seen in terms of business and government. Great point. And another point that I'll be specific in, and been use an office building that I'm intimately familiar with, unfortunately, but to make the point, with the change in configuration of interest deductions, there was a building in my hometown that generated $242,000 a year in rentals. It had been done through a partnership, not a leverage deal, fully collateralized, 100% occupied, not outside investors, only two partners. But because of the change in the 86 code, the building was completed prior to the 86 code, the $246,000 was treated all as personal income to the right. taxpayer. But the interest deduction to the insurance company that financed it was allowed only at $10,000. Right. Whereas the actual economic activity was a slight gain of ten dollars to $12,000 between rent and debt service. But the tax impact of $240,000 with only a $10,000 deduction gave an income tax bill suddenly of sixty dollars and $70,000 on an investment that made $12,000 a year. That's right. And that's what took them down. Not a dishonesty, not a corruption, not a bad planning, not a building that fell down, and not one that wasn't occupied or speculated on. And they I think we need to stress that. And they that. did a great job. Precisely. Basically. They did and, a beautiful job. And they did everything design. right and they got wiped out. It's and very, that very would true. explain your previous comment about good buildings that have tenants, but now lenders don't want them. I would suggest for two reasons and ask if, if you agree. One is because of uncertainty. Since people who did good planning and fair planning got killed retroactively, they're not trusting of a government that might not, in search of revenues with a $300 billion a year budget, do something in addition, True. even on new buildings coming in, because the rules apply retroacti Absolutely. retroactively. Absolutely correct. And That's secondly, correct. because it doesn't have a collateral value under that circumstance, since it's uncertain. And then I'm going to make three points, and please forgive me. One is, at no cost to taxpayers, if we do some of the things you've outlined, collateral value will be improved, but it doesn't require an injection. If a bank is carrying a building, such as the one I just described, whether it's interim or permanent, if it currently is ass assessed at a value of $1 million because of current tax law, if tax law were changed, that building alone might be 3 or $4 million, which on their collateral carried by the bank gives them less pressure from regulators right. because the asset value has been increased, but it didn't cost a taxpayer or a revenue payer one cent. You might even make a profit on RTC after all. I mean, you know, the fact is, if you, if you really wanted to do this, and you'd obviously have to do it across the board, you could probably take RTC and end up starting to make some real sales instead of giving away for five cents on the dollar. I mean, you're selling property for five cents on the dollar that's much better property than that. And all, if you made the proper changes in the tax law, if you made some smart changes, your RTC property could even you wouldn't have to contribute 10 cents to it, in my opinion. And secondly, I represent people who are being foreclosed on who've never missed a payment. That's something else I wish that people out there and at home would know. They've made every monthly payment through other income, and they were affording, able to do so. But because the collateral value was depressed, even though they've never missed one of their bank payments, those loans are being called because the regulatory scheme is saying, well, wait a minute, this property is worth less Therefore, we're demanding three or four million dollars in additional collateral that they don't have. And they are being placed into either bankruptcy or they're being placed into tremendous economic adversity, having never missed one monthly or one quarterly payment.
It's a very unfair circumstance. There are a lot of, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands, and I guess beyond that, people exactly in that circumstance. And the second point I would make is on property tax. If we do nothing in the Congress, if we keep current law, then we're just not having enough years pass where corporations and individuals are recognizing that if their properties are lowered because of the change in the tax code, that they should go to their assessors and get tremendous adjustments, which once again lowers the property tax receipts of counties and parishes, in my case, states, and make them suddenly have to come up with alternative tax packages for their own revenue measures. Right. And is that not, in New York, for example, are there not probably people who are trying to get property tax adjusted dramatically because of the impact on uh, real estate ventures? There are indeed, absolutely. And my final question would be on economic activity. I come from southwest Louisiana, which people refer to as oil and gas community. I used to hear people say constantly we were recession-proof, which I thought was an interesting phrase. I heard it here in northern Virginia. They're suddenly, I think, finding the equal recession-proofness of the two areas. But secondly, I used to hear constantly, I'm not in the oil and gas business. Well, when it collapsed from $40 to 8 and bounced for a while, everyone that sold shoes found out they were in the oil and gas business. Everybody that sold automobiles found out they were in it. And I'm reminded of that today because I think the point you're making is that I'm not in the real estate business, and I no longer am, by the way, don't own one square inch of anything. You're lucky. <laughs> but the point is I'm not in the real estate business can't be said because it is such a large segment that fuels the economy that if you are the shop owner, if you are in medical practice, if you are an attorney, you're in the real estate business because if your community has it collapse as mine did, it didn't just take down real estate developers, it took down everyone. Three out of four of the kids who graduate this year with graduate degrees from my home university leave the state for employment. They didn't have the oil and gas industry either. They weren't realtors, but they can't stay and get a job. And my last point would be this, and then the chairman won't shoot me. For those who think it goes away cyclically, my community has been in the grips of a deep depression for nine years. Right. It doesn't have a term limitation on depressions. And we had better have an affirmative action from a Congress, or I guarantee you there is no guarantee that New York City won't have nine years or 19 years Absolutely. or that we'll ever turn it around. And I would ask if you would agree with that, and then I'll be quiet and hope this time I haven't been too strident for it my mother's sake. said I agree 100%. Thank you very much. I appreciate your coming here also. Thank you very much. Yes, I thank the gentleman from Louisiana for the many suggestions that he made. Perhaps you'd be a great candidate for the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, <laughs> on regard to the non-performing loans, uh, the value to loan should be changed. And uh, many people get trapped because of the banking regulations. They're unfair and unjust. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, just briefly a question, Mr. Trump. We've all been wringing our hands about the RTC and the property that it has on hands and its inability to move it, taking five cents on the dollar. As an investor, what would your opinion be of the Congresses making those kinds of changes in the tax code, as we've indicated, passive loss, modified depreciation, and so on? And then have the RTC, rather than cherry-pick properties, simply batch them on the basis of, of some criteria, chronological listing or whatever, some good with the bad, and put them out there and see what would happen in terms of the market. I think you'd move a lot of property that way. I agree. I think that you should make the changes. You shouldn't sell another property. You should make the changes and then sell the property, and you're going to get money that you wouldn't believe. But not cherry pick in terms of putting the no, best properties I, out. Batch them and let the private with. sector sort it out. I would, I would agree with what you just said. But I really think that you should stop selling property until such time as you straighten out the tax code, because those properties are being sold artificially low because of a bad tax code. Appreciate the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Donald, the real estate industry uh, is 20 percent of our GMP, employs 8 million people, and I understand, according to a statement that you file, there is $200 billion in tax revenues that's realized nationally. And uh, you've spoken up for a very important sector of our economy, and the sector that took the biggest hit in the tax reform of 1986. And there are a number of uh, corrections that should be made for the sake of the growth of our economy. Otherwise, it will be too late if we don't move soon. So I want to thank you for your insights. I thank you for being here. I hope sometime soon we will have the advantage of your thoughts and uh, your suggestions and your contributions before the Ways and Means Committee, because I think some of the tax suggestions you make have a great deal of validity to them. So thank I, you, Mr. I, Chairman. So I thank you for the 
hour or so that you have spent with us, and I wish you well on your way back to New York. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.